welcome to the third season of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. We're an independent podcast with over 125 free episodes. We love what we do and are dying to continue. If you enjoy listening to Murder in 20 every week, we'd be eternally grateful for your support by visiting Murder in 20 at Patreon, PayPal, or Murderin20.com. Thank you for helping us keep our creative minds riding into the wee hours of the night. This week, during our sliding into summer break, we're featuring one of Murder in 20's most intriguing episodes. A fierce storm hit Atlanta, Georgia in January 1973. Freezing rain buried the city in four inches of ice. It coated the streets and brought traffic to a standstill. The ice hung off the power lines until they snapped leaving more than 300,000 people without power. A few months later, Paige Bergfield came into the world, raised by her parents, Frank and Susie, alongside her older brother, Craig. Paige grew up to be a pretty woman with hazel eyes and long sandy brown hair. But the thing everyone noticed about Paige was her smile. Her dream in life ever since she was little was always to be a mother. Her family moved to Denver and Colorado, and at 15, she met Ron Bigler. The high school sweethearts married soon after, but Ron didn't want children, and that led to their decision to divorce after eight years. Meanwhile, Paige, who was a dance teacher, had discovered a very lucrative means of supplementing her income. She became a stripper in the evenings, an occupation she hid from her family and friends. CBC News reported that at 21, she was making $400,000 a year. At 24, Paige met Rob Dixon, a wealthy businessman who was funny and intelligent. Paige was swept off her feet, and they married a year later. In 1999, the couple moved to Grand Junction and bought a house, a one-level ranch home that sat at the end of a private road. They added on to it and turned it into a stately home with 14 rooms, a circle driveway, and manicured lawns. Then Paige and Rob had three children, Paige was living her dream. But Rob took risks with his business, investing millions in ventures that didn't work out. In financial trouble, Paige pitched in. She started a preschool dance school and also sold baby items. But it wasn't enough, so she took on a third job and became a consultant for a kitchen company selling high-end supplies out of her home. Paige was driven and very successful at it and earned a free trip to the Caribbean. Rob continued his downward spiral and by 2004 had lost almost everything. He became angry and violent and one day he threatened Paige by telling her that he'd kill the children and she would come home and find them. Paige called the police. They arrived and managed to diffuse Rob, and no charges were laid. By now, Paige was pretty much the sole breadwinner in the family, but she needed more money than teaching dance or selling baby items or kitchen supplies could provide. She opened an escort agency and called it Models Incorporated. It was a secret life 
that she hid from her family and almost everyone. She confided in only a few close friends. She set up a website offering massages, dinner dates, or company attending parties. In October 2005, Rob discovered Paige's new business and the couple fought about it. He got violent and pushed her down and punched her. She called the police and this time he was ordered to attend a course in anger management. Paige didn't let it stop her. A five foot four, she was tiny but driven. Never one to slack off and with a mind for business, she knew how to make money. She continued teaching dance and selling kitchenware. They used a second cell phone to respond to her escort calls in private and kept a day planner in her purse to keep track of her commitments. The other mothers in her mom's group all strive to be like her. She handled multiple jobs, yet attended every school function, and always with a smile on her face. By September 2006, Rob declared bankruptcy. The couple divorced, and he moved to Philadelphia. Paige was on her own, a single mother with three children. She managed to buy the house from the bank, but had a huge mortgage, over $800,000. She needed money, a lot of money, every month. The Daily Sentinel reported that Paige rented an office on the third floor of an office building and told the owner that she'd mostly be working late afternoons and evenings. She called her business Grand River Acupuncture. The Paige didn't have a business license to perform acupuncture. Paige advertised massage services, but often... Her clients were looking for more, and her agency accommodated them. The office's location was perfect, right next to a staircase that led to an exterior door for her clients' discreet use. Her clients knew her as Carrie, and she was popular. She charged a premium for her services, anywhere from $1,000 to 2500 but her new career wasn't without risk. One night she left her office, and as she got into her minivan, a white pickup truck pulled up behind her and blocked her. Paige was scared. She rammed it into reverse and stomped her foot on the gas pedal. She didn't care if she rammed the truck. There was no way she was going to be trapped. The white truck took off, and Paige was able to go home to her children. Paige never forgot her first love and reconnected with Ron, who lived four hours away in Denver, and the two began a long-distance relationship. One day, Paige received a call from Lester Jones. He was 55, a married RV mechanic. He spent 10 years in prison for kidnapping and assaulting his previous wife while threatening to kill her. She had managed to escape and reported him, but Paige had no knowledge of this. She provided her services, but he gave her the creeps. On June 27, 2007, when he called her a second time, she asked her friend Carol Linderholm, who sometimes worked for her massaging clients, to take the appointment. Carol was nervous and feared going to Lester's house. He was a large man with an overpowering presence. The minute she walked in, he demanded sex. But Carol was only there to massage him and told him that. Lester was obsessed with Paige. He went to a local Walmart store 
and purchased a prepaid cell phone by track phone. The next day, Paige's escort phone was ringing. But it was Thursday, and she had a date with Ron. The two planned to meet in the middle between Grand Junction and Denver. Paige got dressed wearing jeans and a blue strapless top with flowers. She left her children with their live-in nanny and drove her Red Ford Focus two hours to meet Ron at a rest stop. They enjoyed a picnic and spent the afternoon together before heading home. Lester used his new cell phone to call Paige, but she didn't answer. His wife was out of town, so he borrowed her Chevy Impala to drive to Paige's office and circled the building. He called her three more times. Around 9 p.m., Paige was just a few miles from her home when she called Ron and they spoke for a few minutes. Then she used her escort phone and returned Lester's call. He answered. It's not known precisely what occurred, but Lester and Paige met up. He kidnapped her and drove down Highway 50. Paige panicked. What was he going to do to her? Paige was smart. She knew she had to try and send a signal to get help. They'd gone about five miles when she managed to open her purse and without Lester seeing, began to quietly rip checks out of her checkbook. The window was open part way. The car tires hummed on the pavement as she discreetly slipped a check out the window and watched it flutter in the wind. Then seconds later, another and another. When she ran out of checks, she slipped her video membership card, insurance card, and her driver's license out the window. In desperation, Paige had left a trail of breadcrumbs, pieces of her life, in the hopes that someone would find her, rescue her, and take her home to her family. Not long after, Lester stopped the car and assaulted Paige. Fracturing her cheekbone, he bound and gagged her with duct tape. then murdered her. He buried Paige in a dry stream bed and covered her with rocks, weeds, and twigs. Ron didn't hear from Paige again Friday night. Saturday morning, he tried calling her cell phone, but it went straight to voicemail. Then he called her home and talked to her daughter. That's when he discovered Paige had never made it home. He knew she would never leave her children. Something was wrong. He called the sheriff's office and reported her missing. That afternoon, Paige's eight-year-old daughter and their nanny walked into the police station to tell them her mummy didn't come home. Right from the start, they treated Paige's disappearance as foul play. They immediately contacted Paige's father, Frank, in Denver to tell him that his daughter was missing. He called Paige's brother, Craig, who heard his father's voice break as he began to sob. Frank headed to Grand Junction, and so did Craig and his wife, Callie, to take care of the children and search for Paige. Investigators immediately zeroed in on those closest to Paige. Her first ex-husband was quickly ruled out when Ron's cell phone records 
placed him in Denver when she disappeared. And her second husband, Rob, was in Philadelphia. On Sunday, three days after she disappeared, Paige's car was found two miles from her home in a parking lot of an auto parts business. It had been torched. An accelerant had been poured on the driver's side. The flames burned hot, spread across to the passenger side, and licked the roof. But the fire burned itself out. Paige's day planner was found in the car. Four days had been ripped out, starting a few days before her disappearance. Paige's friends knew she never went anywhere without it. And investigators noticed something interesting. The driver's seat was pushed back. Too far for five foot four, Paige to have driven it. The Mesa County Sheriff's Office now suspected Paige had been abducted and was likely deceased. Investigators quickly learned about Paige's second cell phone and her escort business. Using the phone numbers, they contacted her clients that had called her on the day she went missing. They had seven potential suspects. They spoke with Paige's friend Carol, who told officers about the incident with the white truck. They narrowed the list down to three. Of those, one jumped out at them. A man with a previous conviction in criminal past that included sexual assault and kidnapping. Lester Jones. On July 5th, investigators visited Lester at work. His shop turned out to be across the street from where Paige's car had been found. He denied knowing anything about Paige's disappearance or the phone number that called her. Surprisingly, he cooperated by providing his fingerprints, DNA, and even handed over the keys to his white truck. Grand Junction lies within Mesa County, a vast area of 3,300 square miles of desert undergrowth and bushes surrounded by canyons and tall mountain ranges. Search teams of volunteers were formed, but where would they even begin to look for Paige? One of the tireless volunteers was Connie Fluky. She formed a grid pattern and broke the search area down into smaller zones that could be searched on foot. On July 15th, she organized a team that would make a significant discovery. That morning, the search started just after 6 a.m. along Highway 50. Soon, Paige's checks and identification were discovered along the roadside. Among the items found was Paige's business card from her escort agency. Paige's family stood by her. The revelations of what they just learned didn't change anything. She was still their daughter, a sister and mother, and she needed to be found and brought home. A police canine detected the scent of a dead body in the back seat of Paige's car, along with Lester's scent. In August, two dogs were flown in to assist with the search for Paige. A golden lab and a German shorthair pointer were taken to the spot where her car had been found. From there, the dogs traced her scent across the street to the front door of an RV dealership, the same shop where Lester worked. Investigators searched Lester's home and the RV shop. They discovered men's wigs, Viagra, 
condoms, a gas can, and an empty box for a track phone. The packaging from the cell phone led them to Walmart. There, they were able to determine the exact date, time, and even their register the purchase had been made. They retrieved video security footage from the store, and on that date and time, forever etched in film, was Lester, purchasing the track phone. He was even wearing the same clothes he'd worn when police interviewed him. Investigators seized the vehicles belonging to Lester and his wife. Later, when Sergeant Smith called Lester to let him know the cars were ready to be picked up, Lester answered the phone and mumbled, You asked me where I'd bury a body. Confused? The sergeant replied, When did I ask you that? Then Lester Stop speaking. Three months after Paige disappeared, authorities publicly cleared her two ex-husbands and named Lester Jones as their main suspect. They knew Lester had murdered Paige, but the evidence was circumstantial. They felt they needed a body to guarantee a conviction. So Lester walked free for five years. In March 2012, a person hiking along Highway 50 spotted something in a stream bed. Paige was found in an area previously searched, but over the years, the rocks and brush had shifted and revealed her remains. Finding her skull they were able to identify her using dental records and later DNA. Two years later in 2014, Lester was arrested and charged with her kidnapping and murder. When officers approached him, he wasn't surprised and simply put his hands behind his back. He remained in jail until his trial began two years later in July 2016. The prosecution's case was purely circumstantial. ABC News described Lester's wife Elaine, who testified that she couldn't provide an alibi for her husband on the day Paige disappeared. She also testified about his attempted suicide and identified him on the Walmart security video. Lester's defense tried pointing the finger at other suspects. After six weeks, the jury was deadlocked and a mistrial was declared. The prosecution vowed to not give up and talked to the jury to find out what they could do differently. They went back to the evidence and discovered that Lester had called Paige three days before she disappeared. They retrieved surveillance video of her office building and noticed a Chevy Impala driving by at the exact same time Lester's cell phone called Paige. Then they learned Lester's wife had been out of town that day and left her Chevy Impala at home. Ten weeks after the first trial, Lester was on trial again. Closing arguments took place just before Christmas. And after four days of deliberations, the jury found him guilty of first-degree murder and kidnapping. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. In 2021, Lester appealed his sentence. Paige's father attended both trials. He told the press, Motherhood was central to her life. The kids meant everything. As far as a legacy, 
I remember Paige's smile. I would call it radiant. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Dana Sue Gray. She shopped until she went bankrupt. She lost her marriage, her house, cars, boats, and even her job. And still, she couldn't stop shopping. So she murdered three women in cold blood, stole their credit cards, and went shopping. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music, sound effects from Vaseline Studios and Quick Sounds, and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. If you'd like to support our creative, independent true crime podcast, we'd be internally grateful. Rifle through the couch cushions and donate your spare change by visiting Murder in 20 at Patreon, PayPal, or Murder20.com. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.